Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Myers, and I lead the distribution team at Pengana. Thank you for joining us for this webinar update with Seb Below, the Head of Research at Web Asset Management, and Ted Franks, the Fund Manager. Before I logged in this afternoon, I had a quick glance at the registration list, and I was completely blown away. Yes, by the number of registrations, but mainly by the number of new and unfamiliar names on the list. And I think that really speaks volumes about how our collective perceptions have changed over the last year or two and how sustainability and sustainable finance have become a priority for all of us. Today, Seb will be providing a highlights package of the 2020 impact report, Building Back Better. And hopefully in 20 minutes, he'll be able to give you a flavor of how thoughtful and differentiated their approach is to impact and impact measurement. Ted will then discuss performance and some of the drivers of returns over the last quarter. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box that can be accessed from the icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many as possible of those in Q&A at the end. Over to you, Seb. Great, thank you very much, Adam, and um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so yes, as Adam has said, I'm, I'm Seb Below. I'm a partner and head of research at, at Web Asset Management. Um, and I'm gonna be talking you through um, the, the highlights of the impact report in about 20 minutes and then handing over to Ted, um, who will take you through the, the quarter, the second quarter update. Um, so diving straight in, um, 2020, uh, which is the period the report covers, uh, um, and indeed so far in 2021, um, we've continue to you know, experience this extraordinary uh, time with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I don't think any of us would want to repeat the last 18 months, but I, I do think the disruption that COVID-19 has caused has created an opportunity for us to do things a bit differently, to, to reinvent, to, to build back better as the title of our report suggests. Um, enthusiasm for, for ESG and sustainable investing that Adam referred to has, was building already before COVID-19, but the pandemic has clearly really accelerated uh, the shift of assets into more sustainable strategies. And this is obviously extremely welcome. We've been uh, running this strategy at WebNow for uh, since 2012, and in Ted's case, even earlier. Um, and this, this, this sort of uh, renaissance, if you like, in, in interest in sustainable investing is extremely welcome, but it's also making life a bit more complicated for people who are trying to select uh, sustainability strategies, um, particularly for people who want to invest in strategies that have real integrity and belief rather than just clever marketing spin. Um, but there are ways that you can differentiate. And, and one of the ways that we think is really important is by focusing on impact investing, um, which I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about um, before diving into um, the, the, the kind of core content of the impact report. Um, impact investing, as some of you I'm sure know, is fundamentally different to other types of ESG integration because it's focused on the investor's beliefs. It's not something that's easily altered by changing the label of the fund. So what does the, what does the fund, man fund manager actually believe and how is this evidenced in their investment process? On the slide here, we've got the original uh, definition from the Global Impact Investing Network, and I, I think you can see that it highlights the importance of uh, intentionality. What is the intention of the investment? And there are two important words there, intention, but also investment. And intention has to be, in our view, part of the investment decision. For Web, the explicit intention is to invest in companies that are providing solutions to critical sustainability challenges. And so you should expect to see evidence of that intention in the way that we create our investment universe. So the screens that we use at the start of the process. But I think more importantly, actually, you should see evidence in the stock selection process itself. And then of course, in reporting and ownership activity. And ultimately, we believe there should be evidence that the impact story is also a significant part of the equity story. And if it isn't, then it's not really impact investment. So in our uh, report, we do introduce this model of what impact investing in listed equities means to us. Um, it is a bit, a bit complicated, so I just wanted to walk you through some of the key points. Um, 
So the first point is uh, that um, we are, as I said earlier, we are very focused on the impacts that are delivered by portfolio companies through the products and services that they sell in the real world. This process starts with our clients who want to invest in companies that are providing solutions to sustainability challenges. And then we channel that capital into a portfolio of companies, uh, each of which is selected because of the impact intensity of its products and services. So this is number one in the chart there. Um, <clears throat> each of the company delivers their products and services, which then have an a positive impact on the world. And we call that enterprise impact because the impact isn't delivered by us, it's delivered by the companies that we invest in. And then, of course, we report, uh, we measure and report this positive impact back to you through our report that I'll be talking about in a second, our website, this webinar, um, and so on. But there's then a second set of impacts that are delivered directly by web, and we call these investor contributions. And this is done through engagement with portfolio companies uh, to encourage them to focus on delivering more positive impact. And we call that the enterprise level investor contribution. That's 3A in the model. But we also deliver uh, what we've called system level impact. We work with regulators, we work with standard setters to help shape a financial system that supports and enables more positive impact. And we also work with our clients, encouraging more impact investment as part of a larger movement that stretches beyond web to embed sustainability more fully in finance and the wider economy. And we call this system level investor contribution, so that's 3B in the chart. So uh, uh, apologies for the complexity so early in my presentation, but this is a really important model for us and provides a bit of a blueprint for our work and for our reporting. Um, on which subject, I will now turn to um, the uh, key messages from the report itself. Um, but before I do that, I did also want to mention some work that we've been doing over the past couple of years that underpins the integrity of the data that sits behind the report um, and the calculator. Last year, some of you may remember that we commissioned the Carbon Trust, which is an independent consulting firm that advises businesses and investors on carbon reduction strategies. And we, commi we commissioned them to peer review the impact calculation methodology that we have developed that sits behind our report in the impact calculator. <clears throat> and we published uh, their letter in our methodology that uh, outline their conclusion that they found the, the methodology to be robust. This year, we've actually worked with them again to go through the data itself. So yeah, last year it was the methodology. This year it was the data itself that we're reporting in our report and our calculator that covered 98 different data points from 35 different companies going through the completeness, the consistency, uh, the quality of the data sources, a whole range of different criteria um, that they looked at. And um, at the end of the process, they concluded that our approach to data sourcing was fit for purpose and provided a reasonable basis for impact calculations. And that overall, the Carbon Trust believed that the data was of reasonable quality, um, which uh, sounds a very, um, it took a lot of work to get to that statement basically. And we're very pleased that we were able to reach that conclusion. So we have done, uh, we've invested quite a lot of money to really ensure that data quality and robustness uh, is sound. It's extremely important to us because we believe it's extremely important to you too. Um, so I hope that that um, reassures you that uh, this is real data. This isn't just uh, data that we've dreamed up. So here's um, uh, a kind of overall summary slide, if you like, um, from the report. It's, it's a, similar to the table that we reported last year. Um, and there's a lot of information in this table. We have our nine investment themes at the top. Um, I'm sorry that the, the text is a bit small, but it is in the report as well. So you've got the nine investment themes at the top, five environmental and four social, and they align with seven of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the company's products and services are directly supporting seven of those goals. Um, and we've given you in the table detail on the kinds of sector and activity in that first row. Uh, that we're investing in. So one level down from the headline safety, what does it mean in terms of actual business activity? And then we've listed all 47 of the portfolio holdings by theme, uh, 47 companies that we had in the portfolio at the end of 2020. And then you've got the impact data uh, associated with the strategy as a whole, uh, which was about a billion sterling. 
Um, and you can see those are the numbers that the Carbon Trust uh, helped um, review. And I won't go through all of them, but you can see we've reported renewable energy, carbon avoided, water uh, treated, and so on, some health related metrics as well. Um, so um, that's the strategy as a whole. Um, we've also got uh, in the impact calculator the, the data per million dollar, Aussie dollars, million Aussie dollars, in, um, and the impact, uh, the level of impact that's associated with that level of investment. And on the Pengana website, you can obviously change that to whatever it is that you or your clients have invested. And there are a couple of points that I wanted to make about the calculator this year. Um, the first is that following advice from the Carbon Trust, we have changed the denominator in the calculation. So previously that was market cap. We've changed that to enterprise value so that it includes not just the equity, but the debt as well. Um, and by doing so, of course, you, in, you increase the size of the denominator, which reduces the size of the impact. Uh, so the, the impact numbers, are, because of this change, are about 20% less than they were last year. So they are sadly not directly comparable but it is a definitely a more robust way of calculating those figures uh, by using the, the uh, enterprise value. Um, we've, we've increased the number of companies that are reporting data. So this year, 60% uh, of companies in the portfolio are actually reporting at least some level of data. It was 54% previously and under 50% two years ago. So we're seeing nice improvement there. Um, we are estimating for 14% of the strategy. So in total, the, the, these numbers cover about three quarters of the, uh, the holdings in the strategy. And then finally, we've also changed two of the indicators. Uh, we've swapped out uh, indicators around water supplied and preventative healthcare because we've sold the underlying holdings that were linked to those indicators. And we've introduced two new ones. One is around water avoided, which is supported by four holdings and water use that's avoided. And then also we've included one on COVID-19 tests, given uh, the experience of the past 12 months, we thought that would be interesting for people. So um, we hope that the calculator is helpful. It's intended really to show how client money is invested in companies that are delivering real world positive impacts. Um, so I would encourage you to go and look at uh, the Pengana website to, to have a play with the calculator there if you've not done that already. Um, so as in previous years, we want to give you also some examples of, of stocks that are held in the portfolio, not just the high level data, but some of the detail as well. And we're covering three themes this year. Last year, we covered resource efficiency, health and environmental services. This year, we're going to look at sustainable transport, safety and cleaner energy. So starting with sustainable transport, um, this covers a range of areas, including buses and trains and bicycles, but also more prominently, uh, electric vehicles. That's become a real focus for our, uh, in this investment theme, it's something that really didn't exist when we started the strategy is now very much almost a dominant part of this theme. 80% um, of transport emissions come from road vehicles. So reducing carbon from road vehicles is really important. Um, and electric vehicles, uh, the impact of electric vehicles obviously is very dependent on where that electricity is coming from. But in 95%, for 95% of the world's population, electric vehicles are better than internal combustion engine vehicles from a carbon point of view, uh, even in, in regions where you have a high degree of coal-fired power stations, it's still better than internal combustion engines. So this is a big focus for us. And of course, every, every, every year we introduce more green electricity and reduce the carbon intensity of the grid so the story gets better. Um, so one of the stocks that we hold linked to um, battery electric vehicles is a company called Aptive. It's based in the US. It's one of the larger companies in the portfolio with an enterprise value of 41 billion, about $41 billion. Um, and their strap line is enabling safer, greener, and more connected mobility. Um, and they have a particular focus on light duty road vehicles. And their two largest businesses are, uh, the first one is in essentially the management of electricity through the vehicle. Um, so in, in the picture, you can see some of the kinds of products that they're making, uh, the charger um, uh, components, uh, some of the components that go into um, um, managing the electricity through the, through the car, so the cabling, the connectors, the buzz bars. Um, so that's one uh, business. The second business is focused on active safety. So they make the sensing technologies and components as well as the software 
that sit behind active safety systems like lane departure, like blind spot monitoring, and ultimately actually all the way up to autonomous driving as well. Um, so those are the two bis biggest businesses. It's linked with SDG 11, uh, sustainable transport systems fit in under sustainable cities and communities. Um, and then we also provide uh, a bit more detail about what we think about the business. So we have this little um, chart that shows you the impact intensity that we've given this company. That's, that's generated by our impact engine, which is part of our investment process, um, as well as the fundamental quality of the business, which includes an element that's focused on ESG quality as well. This is a very high scoring company. 52% uh, is, is a strong score on the impact engine and 74%. Um, and then this is one of the companies where we estimate data. They don't actually report data, but we, we estimate it. Uh, you can see the impact per million uh, Aussie dollars. And then also we do an awful lot of engagement with our portfolio holdings. We have a long holding period typically. Um, and so with this company, we've, we've, we've talked to them about a number of board, um, board level issues. And this information, by the way, is available for all of our portfolio holdings on the impact map on our website. So that's um, sustainable transport. Um, safety is obviously um, uh, in, our, in our, one of the social themes. Ultimately, sustainable development is about meeting human needs in ways that, don't, that, ways that ensure that future generations can meet their own needs. And obviously, keeping people safe is clearly central to meeting human needs. So we see safety absolutely as part of sustainable development. And, and we invest in a range of companies that uh, help uh, ensure that products are safe as well as companies that make products that keep people safe as well. And one of those companies is a company called MSA Safety. Um, it originally stood for Mine Safety Appliances, actually. They're headquartered in Pittsburgh in the US, which some of you may know is uh, what used to be a, a sort of center for mining. They changed their name in 2014 to MSA because their product portfolio had expanded well beyond mining. Mining is a very small part of their revenue base today. And in fact, one of their bigger products is shown in the image here, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus for firefighters. Um, it represents about 25% about of their revenues. Um, but they also make a whole lot of other stuff like um, um, hazardous gas detectors, you can see down there on the bottom left, and also equipment for keeping people safe when they're working at height, these harnesses that, that connect into a safety line as well. Um, it sits in SDG 11 as well under safer infrastructure. Um, and then we've got the scores for MSA safety too, also pretty good, uh, 68 and 45, those are pretty good scores. Um, we don't report, this is one of the companies that's not currently included, they don't report a, um, a safety um, impact metric for, for their business. Um, although I think we can all agree that it is, it is consistent with our, with our themes. Um, and we have done a lot of engagement with them around board level issues and also toxic chemicals in, their, in some of their products. Um, so finally, uh, the third theme, cleaner energy, which probably doesn't need much introduction is why it's a focus for us. Uh, obviously low carbon electricity generation is critical to uh, addressing climate change, primarily because it's the cheapest way of decarbonizing. Um, it also supports other sectors like transport by enabling them to access uh, zero carbon electricity. And also we believe it'll become a big beneficiary of the push around green hydrogen as well, which will in large part be produced through renewable technologies. Um, so we are very optimistic about the future for cleaner energy. We expect to see, or some scenarios suggest that we'll see a, a, a quintupling of demand for green electricity out to 2050. Um, and the stock that we, we hold a number of stocks, but the one that I'm profiling today is a company called TPI Composites, which makes um, their main business is making wind turbine blades, um, an outsourced supplier of wind turbine blades. It's about 90% of their revenues. They do also have a small, relatively new business that's making um, uh, compo lightweight components that go into um, electric buses as well. Uh, SDG7 is where we've... Uh, position this, this uh, particular holding. It is a slightly lower quality company compared to the other two. They are an outsourced supplier of wind turbine blades, and so they are generally a price taker uh, in the market, but a very impactful stock. Uh, you can see the impact metrics there. And again, we've done a lot of disclosure with them around improving their sustainability reporting, setting a net zero carbon target, which they have now done. 
and uh, also on the, the subject of uh, ensuring that wind turbine blades are recyclable, which is not the case currently. So those are um, uh, just a quick uh, dip into some of the portfolio holdings that we that we have. Um, I did also want to talk about um, the ESG characteristics of the strategy, and there's obviously a lot more detail in the report itself, uh, so I can't cover all of them, but I did want to just highlight some aspects of the carbon footprint of the strategy. Um, there are lots of numbers here, but I know they are increasingly important to people, um, and uh, I thought I'd just quickly walk you through um, the um, some of these numbers. So at the top there, you have the total emissions associated with the strategy, scope one, scope two emissions, um, and those have increased since the end of 2019, mainly because the strategy has become much larger. Actually, it's, it's nearly doubled in size, so you, you might have expected those numbers to grow even more. Um, but um, So that's at the total emissions level. And then you have these other metrics that are normalized, in the first case, by the amount that's invested, so the carbon footprint, and that's come down quite significantly as we've shifted into lower carbon businesses over that period. The carbon intensity, quite confusingly, has gone up. Uh, we think that's mainly due to COVID and the impact on the sales, which is what that's focused on. Um, and then the weighted average carbon has come down as well, and that reflects, uh, again, the shift into lower carbon intensity companies. We do also report scope three emissions, which is the emissions, which is, uh, yeah, emissions associated with the value chain and with the use of the product. Um, and that's gone up just because of changes in portfolio weights within the within the strategy. So a sort of a, a modest increase there. Ultimately, of course, all of these numbers be, need to be at or near zero by 2050. So that's kind of the most important thing. And uh, we would expect to see these numbers, uh, all of these numbers uh, trend down over the next few years, hopefully. Um, the other aspect of uh, the strategy from a carbon point of view is uh, the proportion that I wanted to share with you today is the proportion of businesses in the strategy that have committed to go net zero carbon uh, by a certain uh, date. Um, and you can see over the last, this is only 18 months now this, that we've collected this data over, and you can see there's been a significant improvement from basically nothing at the end of 2019 to about just under a third of the portfolio with um, clear uh, net zero carbon targets. Um, we still obviously have a long way to go. Our, our own target is that by 2025, 50% of the portfolio should have set themselves net zero carbon targets. Um, given we're at nearly a third, uh, that should be doable. And then by 2030, 100% of the portfolio should be covered. Um, so that's what we are shooting for uh, in terms of uh, net zero carbon commitments for the portfolio. Um, and then the, the final thing I wanted to touch on before. Um, handing over to Ted is uh, around our engagement and our voting. We we do, as I as I mentioned previously, we are we have about forty seven stocks. We have six analysts now on our investment team. We have a lot of resource to ensure that we are very actively engaged with the, the companies that we hold. But here are some statistics about the voting that we do. We're very active. We 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 vote against uh, nearly uh, well nearly every company in the portfolio gets at least one vote against them. Um, and then in terms of engagement as well, uh, we, uh, we undertake engagement with uh, over three quarters of the portfolio every year. You can see the subjects that we're engaging on there. Um, and then also by geography too, um, again, more detail in the report. So I won't go into it in too much depth now. Uh, and then the final, the final aspect that we measure is how successful we're being with our engagement. Um, and you can see that the and we rate our engagement as being either successful, partially successful, or unsuccessful. And you can see that there has been a dramatic increase in the amount of successful and partially successful engagement over this time period, um, particularly recently. And I think we have to uh, acknowledge that um, while some of that is due to us, and explicitly so, we've got a little quote here from Intertech, uh, who set a net zero carbon target, you know, in, in significant part because we kept badgering them to do this, um, but we also have to acknowledge that actually, because the whole or a, a, a large part of the community now, the asset management community is now engaging around ESG issues, this is making the engagement that we have with companies more successful because everybody is now pushing in the same direction. So um, I hope that wasn't too much of a, 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 a sort of gallop through the, the headlines. 
Uh, as I say, there's much more in the report itself and on, on the website. So please, if you're interested, do go and get more information there. Um, and then I will hand over to, uh, to Ted, who will take us through the uh, second quarter results. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Seb. Um, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I will start to share. Okay. Um, everyone can see that, hopefully. And I'll assume someone will pop up and tell me if they can't. So I'm uh, Ted Franks, a partner and the fund manager here at, at Web. I'm very glad I didn't realize Adam said lots of new people on board. So that's uh, really good. Very pleased to meet you for the first time. What I'm going to do now is run through um, the quarterly updates. Uh, we've done this every quarter since the uh, lockdown. You know, one of the, the beneficial side effects prompt us to get into webinars in the first quarter of 2020. And um, we do find it's a good way to keep people updated. But it is just a quarter. And actually, our investment horizon is more like five years. In fact, our turnover implies a much longer hold period at the moment. So always bear that in mind when we give you the updates uh, on this sort of time frame. Now, the first slide actually um, isn't about the strategy itself. And we try not to be uh, too self-referential in where we have a um, around Christmas time, we tend to provide a bit more information about how the business is going. But I thought it was worth just highlighting now that this investment team, I think as Seb kind of touched on, um, for a long time until this year, it was four of us, Seb, T, Ben and I, Ben the most recent joiner in 2015. We've added uh, Claire who joined in January and Victoria's come on just at the start of July. Um, they're both brilliant analysts and really committed to impact. So we're delighted with them both. Um, I think it's just also worth highlighting, I think as you get an impression from what Seb's been talking about, uh, part of the importance of this is that we've always wanted to have an integrated approach, integrating and thinking deeply about impact by the same individuals and the same team that's doing the investment decision making. And that does require um, a decent amount of resource. I think we would say that in terms of the size of the decision making unit, it can't really be that much bigger than six, but it's got to six now and we now feel really excited about the kind of work we're going to be able to do with these companies. And a lot of that, as Seb's just been mentioning, uh, relates to engaging with them and really becoming a much more active owners of capital. And for those of you that don't know, this is a single strategy that Web runs. It's uh, in Aussie dollars now, I think it's like two and a half billion, of which the Australian sleeve you guys are in is about 200 million Aussie. Um, so it's, it's getting to the scale where we can be really influential for our companies, which is really important for us. Okay, so uh, with enough said on that, and obviously happy to take questions, I'll go on to uh, what happened in the uh, second quarter. So the first part of this is kind of a, a macro observation of a key investment topic before I go on to a bit more detail of some of the sort of uh, detailed thematic performance. And really the second quarter of 2021 from an investment point of view is all about inflation. It had been a key, it's been a key topic for really over a year now as people have been thinking about it, having been subdued for so long, the prospect of rising inflation, potentially rising interest rates, making a huge difference to how people think about assets. And you can see the chart on the left-hand side, both the expectations and the actual numbers uh, starting to tick up um, uh, sometime uh, last year and obviously getting to uh, continue that trend in the, in the second quarter. And now we're obviously seeing some you know, quite interesting data points, US inflation running at 5.4% here in the UK, we're at 2.5%, numbers we haven't seen for a long time. Now, that's interesting from an investment point of view, and has approximate cause from the uh, uh, emergence from lockdown, the bottlenecks that still exist. It's also got kind of a medium term cause to do with deglobalization and potentially trade tensions and the way that the world thinks about manufacturing. But it's got a sustainability angle to it too, clearly, which is that as the world is digesting this reality that we're going to try and make this big energy transition to cleaner energy, the demand for certain uh, commodities is going to be put under a lot of strain and there's potential for real um, uh, imbalances there and bottlenecks. And here's a chart from the International Energy Agency talking about the proportion of the usage of these different uh, materials from cleaner energy and battery storage. And lithium, kind of the most obvious uh, poster boy for this, they're saying, you know, 90% of lithium uh, demand uh, under their uh, SDS, which is Sustainable Development Scenario, which is kind of the most optimistic scenario they have for emissions abatement, 90% of that lithium is going to be used for cleaner energy. And of course, this chart is scaled to 100. The actual total amount of lithium that's going to be used is obviously going to be much greater. And so that feeds into inflation. You can see uh, those uh, commodities already, um, some fairly sizable upward moves. And that's just um, an interesting uh, uh, thought for us as running a sustainability strategy because that will feed into input costs and it makes us need to think carefully 
about our companies and what they can do in terms of margins. And margins uh, it, uh, were important this quarter as well, as they tend to be when people start to think about an inflationary environment. So just taking a quick detour here into kind of fund manager orthodoxy about what happens in an inflationary period. Um, this is the chart here on the left hand side, which is uh, expectations for operating margin for our universe, for our benchmark, which is the MSCI world. And, and the, the logical framework for this is that if your company is able to raise its prices as a result of an inflationary environment, a strong demand environment, uh, in the first period at least, they'll do that. Probably the only input costs which will increase significantly would be raw material one, raw material costs in the first period. Labor costs will have a lag, overheads will have a lag. And so you should see this margin expansion period. And, and that's exactly what uh, the consensus is expecting from the benchmark. And what that meant in the first quarter is companies that could demonstrate that they were able to capture some of this margin upside were rewarded. Um, and we've got examples here on the right hand side of five of our companies which performed well in the quarter. And you know, an approximate reason for that being that their margins in the first quarter of this year were much better than the margins in the first quarter of next year. They, so they got a tick in the box from the market's point of view. Those that didn't get a tick in the box include two Japanese names we own, uh, both beginning with the letters DIA, so Daifuku and Daikin. Um, so both of these companies uh, came out with guidance, uh, three-year guidance, which is one of the hallmarks of Japanese companies. Not everything they do communication-wise is perfect, but this is always quite handy. Uh, and particularly if you look at the top part of this slide, you can see those margin expansion targets, 110 basis points and 90 basis points. In a quarter in which people were very interested in fixated on margins as a result of inflation, this was not received well and these companies uh, struggled a bit. Uh, a couple more points to make about this. First of all, you can see in the bottom half of this slide, those new three-year targets were more completely integrated with environmental aims than we've seen from these companies before. And although it's now becoming relatively commonplace, which we're delighted with, um, this strategy actually has a, a you know, more than 15 year history. And certainly in the sort of more than a decade that I've been involved with it, uh, we've never seen this level of integration of environmental targets with financial targets. And obviously we're very supportive of that and it's great. Now, the other point about that, these two stocks, and I don't wanna give them a pass on this, but the reason why we still like them and our long-term investors in them is that if you look at the green bars on this slide versus the uh, which are the achieved margins versus the blue bar which is what they laid out in previous plans um daikin didn't manage it in the recent cycle because of lockdown we give them credit for that otherwise they do tend to lowball this guidance and you know we're not saying that we have crystal ball that'll definitely be the case this time but certainly we think the response in this quarter was was unwarranted Okay, so I will now uh, pivot away from inflation, which was the big kind of macro uh, investment view of the quarter as we saw it, onto a different way of talking about our performance, which is kind of the more standard way we like to do it. And if I'm conscious that there are new people on, on board, I'll try and sort of maybe take this ever so ever so slightly slower. So our strategy at what we call the top level has nine themes, and we've always talked about our attribution in the context of those nine themes. It's not perfect because the themes aren't entirely heterogeneous and um, homogenous inside them. So not all the stocks inside each theme will move for the same reasons. But it does give us enough of a framework um, and hopefully helps you guys to understand what we're doing. Now, in this quarter, which was an underperformance quarter, not a, a huge one, but a, sm a smallish one, we're going to focus on some of the reasons for that underperformance. So I'll talk in a moment about the education theme, cleaner energy and the thematic selection effect. And I'll talk at the end a little bit about some of the positive news uh, out of the well-being theme as well. Okay, so starting with the education theme. Now, education is not a big theme for us. It's two positions. And so to have a big negative contribution, they, you can understand they didn't do well at all, these companies. Both of these companies are providers of for-profit uh, higher education in the US. We like them from an impact point of view because the cohorts that they serve are very needy. They tend to be uh, 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 less advantaged communities, individuals trying to advance their careers, make better lives themselves, and also cope with some of the shifting changes in employment patterns um, as technology changes. And so we think they're very impactful stocks. They are not uncontroversial, though. We're open, our eyes are open to this because there are uh, significant movements in the US, particularly in the Democratic Party, that see any for-profit education as inherently bad. And there's good reasons for that because some of the bad actors in the for-profit education 
sector have been very bad and have high, high levels of student uh, debt default and not very good outcomes. <clears throat> Companies we invest in, Grand Canyon Education and Strategic Education, We've chosen them because they have these good outcomes. And they are definitely seen as the high quality operators. But getting to the point about this quarter, with a new democratic administration in place since the start of the year, they are now returning to the education sphere to see if they're going to change the regulations. They're doing something right now, which is called the negotiated rulemaking process. It happened on via Zoom, as you can see in the picture. And there are some prominent um, uh, characters, uh, Dick Durbin, a senator from Illinois, very notable, who do have a real, um, have these companies in their crosshairs. As I say, we think they're very impactful. We certainly like a lot of the innovative things they've been doing about um, improving invest, uh, um, student outcomes. Um, and actually we see them as real value opportunities at the moment, but the sentiment is, uh, is tricky there. Then on to cleaner energy. And cleaner energy had uh, an enormous run up in 2020 as the net zero carbon commitments were being made. And also as uh, the world was still, um, the investment world was still moving to a sort of a low, a long, long-term low interest rate environment. Quite naturally, as inflation has come back into the equation, some of that um, valuation uh, benefit those companies experienced has, has uh, drifted away a little bit. Effectively, the market's digesting what is the investment opportunity in terms of cleaner energy. We're pretty clear what it is. It's pretty uh, dramatic. But of course, it has to be played and invested, we think, in the right way. And one of the areas that we haven't really been able to be comfortable with is investing in the companies that, that uh, do the development of the cleaner energy projects. For the reason that we see a lot of capital going into that sector, bringing returns down. And indeed, in the second quarter, um, Equinor and Orsted, both of them uh, Scandinavian former oil and gas operating, or Equinor still has a large oil and gas operation. Orsted's moved on from it, its operations in that sector. They both said that they're going to see um, reduced cost of capital and reduced uh, internal rates of returns on their um, projects going forward because of all this capital that's coming in to invest in this space. We instead invest in the equipment providers who these companies would be buying the equipment from to make the projects. And we think the prospects for those companies is, is rosier, but certainly this cast a bit of a negative sentiment across the sector. Now, still staying um, on cleaner energies, we'll come on to, a, in, on to in a moment, but taking a quick tour around another theme, which those that have uh, been on these webinars before will have heard me talk about um, a fair amount, and that is the tension between China and the US. It continues to be something that anyone who's a global investor in kind of technology-led companies is quite interested in because it can be very disruptive. We saw more in the second quarter of how the Biden administration is going about this, and they obviously have a much more um, meth um, methodical way than the previous administration, although interestingly, the sentiment is kind of exactly the same. The thing that looks like the moon on the right-hand side is an infographic uh, depicting the US Innovation Competition Act, which passed you know, with bipartisan support. Um, uh, in this quarter as well. You can really look at that as a kind of American response to Chinese technological threats. It's, it's an allocation of money to various uh, key areas. And as a sidebar to that, returning to my point about cleaner energy, um, uh, although not involved in an act per se, there are now movements afoot to look carefully at uh, cleaner energy, in particular China's dominance of the um, silicon uh, photovoltaic value chain. Now, this has been a huge success for the world in terms of emissions reduction because China has um, you know, continually brought the cost of that technology down. But they have done so effectively, well, not effectively, genuinely by unfairly subsidizing their companies and allowing practices to flourish, which wouldn't be allowed in other markets. Most notably and most troublesome is the fact that a lot of the silica that they produce in Xinjiang seems to have been done so under forced labor conditions. And this resulted in this quarter in a withhold and release order from the US Department of Homeland Security saying, we won't accept silica-based products from certain of these companies that seem to be used forced labor. Now, that in itself gave one of the companies that we invested in a, uh, a change in their prospects. And the company we've invested in the quarter is called First Solar. It's a US manufacturer of solar, solar panels. It uses a different technology called FinFim technology instead. We've been wanting to invest in solar for a long time because it's so impactful. It's traditionally been quite hard to invest in because of that cost curve coming down. We think there's an opportunity now for First Solar, which has excellent ESG credentials, a differentiated technology, um, and particularly if the world is recognizing the cost that comes with Chinese PV, then I think that's really potentially an interesting opportunity. So we've invested in them. Okay, so getting to the end, sorry, it's been quite a sort of long uh, presentation so far. Just refreshing again here on the thematic attribution. So now I'm gonna talk about thematic selection effect, and you see we have it in a different color category from the other themes. 
The thematic selection effect is the attribution to um, all of the stocks in our benchmark, which are outside our universe, which is a lot of them because there's only 15% overlap. So it's effectively telling us whether investing in sustainability as we see it, our universe opportunity set, has been a headwind or a tailwind in the quarter. You can see here, it's been another big headwind for us. And I just want to put that into a little bit of context. We took the 12 month periods that the strategy has been run that we've had access to, we've got 38 of these or something, and we ranked them. And the single strongest negative thematic selection effect over a 12 month period is the one that we've just had. And the second worst is the one in the last quarter. Now, the reason for this is that in the early cycle of an economic cycle, and apologies if I'm repeating what happened last quarter, I'm trying to imagine the new people on board. But the reason for this is that in the early stage of an economic cycle, you get strong performance out of financial stocks, energy stocks, um, real estate. And these are sectors where we don't find a lot of solutions to sustainability challenges. So we have seen this before, as you can tell from this chart as well, through the end of 2016 into 2017, this was another period of negative uh, thematic selection effect headwind. And we will expect it to roll off, but it has been uh, quite notable for a little while. Um, Okay, so uh, last two thoughts, um, last two companies before we uh, wrap up and take questions. Best performing stock in the quarter was Sonova and our wellbeing theme. Sonova is a maker of hearing aids. We like hearing aids for their impact because it's very important for mental health in older populations. The other business they've got is a cochlear implant business. You guys probably know that the world leader in that is an Australian business actually called Cochlear. Um, the cochlear imparts business is also very, very impactful because the change it makes for those particularly children's lives is, 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 very, is hugely profound. We invested in Sonova in April 2020 when we saw that the market was uh, very afraid of the impact of lockdown in terms of, of people's ability to be fitted out. And there was kind of a, 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 a value opportunity for a stock we'd been watching or been aware of for a while. And what they show, came out and showed in this quarter was that the worries around there being a temporary dip as a result of COVID were really misplaced. They're managing an 8.3% annual growth, you know, compound annual growth rate across the two years of the COVID challenge. And that's really partly because of the success of their products. And this one here, the um, uh, Audio Paradise, it's called Phonak Audio Paradise, and the app that supports it uh, seems to be taking share. It's a, it's a very well-run company. They've got good products. But also really because that demographic bulge of the baby boomers getting into hearing aid ages is just starting now. And also a lot of the stigma around hearing aids has gone as people are so used to wearable devices. So that's an investment which we're very positive about. Then last one from me, um, another stock that did well in the wellbeing theme was HelloFresh. You guys may be aware of it as the home meal kit provider. We like it from the wellbeing point of view in terms of the healthy diets that they promote. We also like the sustainability um, aspect of the way that it's precision food delivery. So you actually have just the right amount used and delivered in a, a sustainable way with, you know, um, carefully thought through packaging strategies. So we do think it's potentially the future of, um, of better nutrition in the home. Now, we put it on here on this slide with another stock we own, which is Ecolab. The two of them had this sort of nicely contrasting experience as the second quarter contained more sort of lockdown activity than a lot of people expected. You know, the vaccine rollouts were slower than people uh, had hoped. And you can see there, HelloFresh definitely benefiting from continued strong growth. And our investment thesis is that this is a permanent change in the way people eat at home. And it's not just about uh, availability in lockdown. And Ecolab, who provides sanitation and hygiene services in a very intelligent way, which is very much about water preservation, but they are exposed to end markets, including the eating out market and the restaurant chains, you can see they're having a tough time. The last chart to talk about is the one on the right hand side here which is just to say our thesis is that over time and it's been a 50-year trend that trend towards people eating out is not going to stop just as a result of the dip that you can see in the pandemic and Ecolab's management are very um, positive about this they say that actually we will return to the restaurants and the bars but we will be much more careful about sanitation so the opportunities there and we think that's true At the same time we think hello fresh will take an increasing share of the, de the decreasing overall market of eating at home are very positive about that opportunity as well okay so with that thank you for listening i appreciate there's an awful lot that's come at you between these two segments and i will now um i think we'll open the floor to, floor to q a great thank you very much um it was very comprehensive i'm not sure we did as well with time as we were hoping but <laughs> <laughs> sorry we have still got some time for questions and we do have a number of them um, so, Ted, first question here for you is what about the profitability of manufacturing electric vehicles relative to manufacturing internal combustion engines? EVs have fewer moving parts, etc. 
is this part of your analysis and can you comment? Yeah, no, I mean, it is part of our analysis. The, um, and it's dead right, I think. And I think we've seen enough data to show that. First of all, Tesla um, obviously leading the way, but now the um, OEMs, now that they've embraced uh, EVs, I would say, you know, slower than they should have done, but they're also making these noises quite clear that they're getting mo better margin out of electric vehicles. It could be a little bit false at the moment because people are prepared to pay a premium and the automotive market's very me messed up at the moment. There's a very clear supply and demand imbalance, partly caused by this shortage of chips. But yes, you can charge good prices for EVs. They do have fewer moving parts. And also what's actually happened here, and you've got to be sort of um, you know, careful a little bit about how I sort of frame this, but the old automotive market was fairly tightly sewn up, particularly by the Germans. And there was a whole ecosystem that worked about you know, which companies got which margin for what. And of course, all those pieces have been thrown up in the air. A lot of the components now come from markets which have a more competitive edge to them. So I do expect that the uh, EVs will continue to be more profitable. The last comment I'd make, though, is we don't, the only OEM, the only uh, brand that we would invest in would be Tesla. We've never got happy with the um, valuation of that and, you know, admit to our, to our cost because it would have been, obviously, it's been a stellar investment at times. Um, the other OEMs, they're not enough EV manufacturers for us to invest in. And actually, because they're all going to probably move at about the same pace, it's unlikely that any of them will differentiate themselves as EV makers. I think Polestar, the Volvo subsidiary, is probably about to list. So I guess that would qualify as well. But just to be clear, we, we, don't, we won't own, you know, Stellantis or GM or, or those guys, Volkswagen, um, because, you know, they're not enough EV and they're not differentiated by it at the moment. Great, thank you. Seb, we have a number of questions now relating to um, zero carbon emissions. So I may ask all of them. Um, I will ask them one at a time. Firstly, do you analyze the company's net zero carbon plans? Sometimes these statements are being made and yet there is no credible plan to achieve them. Um, absolutely. So, I mean, in fact, that was... Uh, um, a topic that we we addressed in a slightly longer format of the Q2 update. Um, so I'm happy to share slides with anyone who's interested in, in the detail there. Um, I mean, obviously, the first step is the commitment. And so that's been a big focus for us uh, over the couple of, last couple of years. And we, I should say we are pushing them to have more aggressive targets than just 2050. We've typically been pushing them to have a 2030 target. But uh, in some cases, it is extremely important. Well, virtually impossible to have a 2030 target because the technologies just aren't there yet. Um, but so the commitment is the first thing. Um, and we are now seeing companies come forward with more detailed strategies. And we are absolutely scrutinizing those. Um, I look, we looked in detail at JB, JB Hunt and Daikin, the company that, uh, that Ted mentioned, the Japanese company, uh, and have, have kind of pub, uh, published our, our, our assessments of those um, broadly, uh, good start, lots more to do kind of thing. Uh, there is definitely some, some definitional issues as well where companies are using um, imprecise terminology to perhaps slightly uh, wiggle their way through in a way which isn't really um, true to the science. So we are, we are definitely holding them to account. Um, so that's the question about uh, the net zero targets. Was there an, another one as well? Yes. Um, how do you manage the balance between wanting a low carbon portfolio, but equally wanting to drive change in a higher carbon business? Obviously, divestment or simply not investing is not the solution. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important that um, as an investor, we know what we do. You know, we, we have a particular uh, focus with our strategy. And I think it's important to be true to that and not kind of not try not have mission creep as it were um you know and our focus is is very explicitly on investing in companies providing solutions that's that is what this is all about our strategy it doesn't mean uh, like the question infers it doesn't mean that there are other important aspects of uh asset management that can have a bearing on the the, the big polluters of today and getting them to change um but that's that's not what we do we we just focus on the enablers we do try and check, you know, we do exert pressure on them through the work we do on regulation, on standard setting. You know, we are a very active part of the policy group at the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change. We've been providing, you know, feedback on consultations like the, the uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. So we do exert pressure on that part of the market, but just indirectly through our work. 
uh, in, in policy circles. Mm. Right. I think, I, I, if I, sorry, if I just quickly add as well, I mean, and the other point of that, um, you know, to Seb's point, even with the core focus on solutions providers, we also don't shy away from the fact that if you want to change the environment, you do need to interact with it. And the, and the portfolio has got a, a heavy weight in industrial companies. And I would just observe that, you know, clearly a quick route to a decarbonized portfolio is to buy software companies and equivalent. And we're not, um, you know, we're not afraid of the fact that actually we need to, we need to do some engagement with our companies because they do have footprints by definition because they're the ones solving the challenge. Great. I'm going to ask one more on this theme and then I'm going to move on because I'm sure there are people who, who are less interested. Um, this is from a person who's obviously involved in the industry and he's seen a shift from the use of 2050 to um, people referencing 2035 and also dropping the term net um, if we're really going to have an impact on temperature rises. What are your thoughts on bringing some of these targets for the fund and investments forward significantly yeah i mean i think um i mean obviously uh 2050 as a target although companies kind of you know announced them uh, with great fanfare uh two-thirds nearly three quarters of the world have commitments to be net zero carbon by 2050 so whole economies are going to have to be net zero carbon so actually just announcing that your company is going to be net zero carbon by 2050 really isn't, it shouldn't be saying that much because economies need to be doing that. So we, we, we have been pushing companies, as I say, to, to set more aggressive targets. Um, in some cases, it's ex, it is extremely difficult. So one of our businesses that we invest in, Smurfit Kappa, which uh, produces recycled cardboard, you know, some of their capital investment decisions have a 30-year time frame. So they are making decisions today uh, that will have an impact still in 2050. And um, to really decarbonize uh, their their business, you need to have green hydrogen, um, which isn't available for those applications anywhere in the world. There aren't even pilot tests yet. So, you know, we have a massive amount of work to do to get to a point where it is actually going to be possible to get these businesses to go net zero carbon. Um, on the net, um, I mean, I totally appreciate that point. What we have been focusing on is getting companies to have their targets uh, validated by the Science Based Targets Initiative which I'm sure people will be familiar with. Um, and in fact, for the four businesses in our portfolio that re represent 60% of the emissions, so by far, you know, these four account for the majority of our emissions, they have all committed to having their targets validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. So that's kind of the way we've been going, focusing on the heavy emitters and getting them to get their targets validated as, as soon as possible. That's been the kind of focus for us. Great, thank you. Um, Ted, you showed a bit of a scary chart displaying the pullback in valuations of the renewable energy stocks. Um, what do you think about valuations at current levels? <laughs> yes, I mean, th those, yeah, um, it's quite dramatic, isn't it? I have to say, I, I confess, I, it's accurate in terms we published it from uh, the data. I don't have an insight into the underlying exactly what's going on there. So there can be base effects and maybe other things. But I think it's broadly directionally right. I think at the moment, the valuations are um, returning to a point where we might get more interested. But actually, as it happens, we already have Vestas, TPI Composites, now First Solar. I think as a, as a team, we're looking for you know, maybe one or two other cleaner energy exposures, if we can find them. And we do think, actually, given the opportunity, that you, you can really make a case now if you have the horizon that we have for some of these names. Um, you know, that said, it's not so straightforward either. So it's kind of an interesting point where we might be able to add another name. I think the, um, uh, obviously the deeper, you know, if you think about valuation, you think about uh, growth rates, you think about returns, you think about the cost of capital, okay? So in this industry, people don't know exactly yet what the returns are gonna look like. They don't know which of the business models are gonna stay robust. And obviously cost of capital is in flex at the moment. The growth rate is the thing that's not in question. And, and what we're trying to do, obviously, is trying to figure out, you know, what feels like there's justification at the moment for some of these names, whether that's actually the case or not. Great, thank you. Um, next question, are you seeing private equity taking a stronger position in emerging opportunities, renewables, green hydrogen, et cetera, than um, the public market? Well, it's a good question. Obviously, private equity is an increasing part of um, 
uh, the global financial scene. I think I think as fans of kind of transparency and also um, democratizing capitalism, we're a little bit nervous about that generally. But this is a topic for a different day. I would have said yes that this is where uh, the capital is coming from, and certainly a lot of it is. I guess the squiggle on that is that there's been an awful lot of uh, public market issuance in form of form of IPOs and particularly the special purpose acquisition vehicles, acquisition companies that had a big flurry at the start of this year and the end of last year. And a lot of those names, interestingly, were in the impactful space. Now, the dynamic you need to watch for is that many of those companies that came to market with a, with, on, through the SPAC process had previously tried private equity processes and not managed. <laughs> so if there's a dynamic where the less the more speculative and risky stocks are finding it easier to raise capital in public markets. As investors, you you have to watch that. But that is a public market fight back against um, a strong private equity interest in this space. Um, but so, sorry to answer the question. Certainly, I don't see it as 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 though private equity is monopolising this this space yet. And of course, we need, generally speaking, we need as much capital into the sector as we can of any sort um, right now because it's very urgent what we're trying to do. Makes sense. Um, and on the subject of new technologies, are you looking at synchronous condensers and other enabling technologies for the renewable energy <laughs> transition? <laughs> yeah, That's I a have to admit, Seb, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I have to confess, I have been frantically Googling what the hell is a synchronous condenser um, because I've, I've not heard of the technology before. But, uh, but it is, um, having now Googled it, it is part of... Um, essentially the grid, you know, enabling the grid to operate more efficiently. And that is certainly an area that we're interested in. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a great article in The Economist a few years ago called, you know, electrify everything um, on the basis that um, decarbonizing, decarbonizing electricity is the cheapest way of, of decarbonizing the economy. So if we electrify cars, if we electrify heating systems, that will be the best way of decarbonizing, which we, we would subscribe to. So we certainly have a lot of exposure to the electrical infrastructure um, kind of uh, space, not through synchronous condensers as yet, as, uh, as far as I'm aware, but, uh, but in a range of other technologies, yes, we do. Great. Um, you made a point um, that you engaged with Eptiv on overboarding. I'm assuming that's not a nautical term? <laughs> no, although sometimes you might wish it were. No, the um, it's uh, where you have uh, directors who sit on, in our view, too many boards. Uh, you, you do get some directors who sit on, you know, seven or eight boards. And in our view, you're not able to give adequate attention to our board if you have uh, seven or eight commitments. So, um, yeah, we vote against, I think it's four. If you're a chairman, that counts as two as well. So it's, sometimes it's a bit complicated. But, uh, yeah, that, that's something that does crop up occasionally. Great. Thank you. I think... In the interest of time, I'm quickly going to answer one last question myself. Um, the, the fund is unhedged um, from a currency perspective. But other than that, we are going to wind it up now. Um, there are a few questions that we didn't get to, but in the interests of time, we will respond to, to those directly. I don't want people to, to, stay, <laughs> to, to, to stay on this call for too long. Um, Please take a look at our Impact Micro site, impact.pingana.com. I think that you'll find um, the Impact Calculator and a lot of the other tools very interesting to look at. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And if you have any other questions, please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks and have a good evening.